So I'll start with a disclaimer. Um, Eric Anderson from Canton, uh, from Palmyra, uh, developed this PowerPoint. So I am shamelessly stealing everything that he had. I love it when that happens. It's a good thing. So we are going to talk about the two-hour meeting and hopefully the death of that. It is uh, no surprise to a lot of folks that obviously we live in a much different world than we did primarily uh, due to communication, good and bad. So we now have the internet to contend with. We now have cell phones to contend with. Everybody has theirs on vibrate, right? Okay. We have instant information. Um, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram. I'm sure there'll be another one coming soon. So social media invades. And all of these things change the nature of communication in the church and change the structure and the needs right down to the council meetings or board meetings. So the church board meeting used to be the place where we kind of hammered everything out. All of the information came in and that august group sat and processed through everything and then the information flowed back out to the congregation, right? Well, times have changed. Um, what worked then doesn't necessarily work now. Uh, used to be that board meetings were somewhat of a social event and folks didn't really mind spending most of their evening um, with, uh, you know, with their friends at church. But now we've got schedules and we've got other events and things that are, that are causing pressure. And no one wants to spend an entire evening at a church council meeting. Eric, in his presentation, said that everyone wanted to get home to see Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> I don't watch Dancing with the Stars. I don't. So at any rate. If that's a good framework for you, go with it. So let's look at a typical meeting. So we're going to start with prayer, of course, and then we have the minutes. And you know, we have to read the minutes, right? Someone has to read the minutes. And then there might be one or two things that need to be changed in the minutes, correct? The wrong person was quoted or the wrong something, just, just a tick off. So we have to do that make changes to the minutes. Then we move on to the financial statement. The financial statement, of course, has to be reviewed during the meeting, and you get board questions like, what's this charge for $120 for new church music? Did we approve that? I don't think so. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Make sure that we're comfortable with that. Finally, you get through that and into committee reports, UMW, discussion about the last meeting that they held, the decisions that were made, kind of a rundown of that meeting, and on to the worship committee, and um, things such as, well, they received a $37 flower offering, and they want to pass out carnations on May 8th for Mother's Day. The board questions come, well, $37, who did that come from, and should that stay there, or should that go into a different fund? And what color carnations are you going to hand out? Because, you know, if they're white carnations, that's usually for mothers that are no longer with us, so that might not be appropriate. Possibly we could do red carnations, but that might not be appropriate for those whose mothers are not still here. Maybe we should just do blue. So we have all of this kind of discussion. Then we can move on to the Sunday school, and you can see at this point we're already about an hour in and uh, have a Sunday school report where we want to honor a couple of graduates on May 8th. Well, of course, the worship committee, whoa, 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 we're honoring mothers on May 8th. Can we do both on May 8th? Because that might get a little, a little hairy, so we have to have some discussion about that. Then move on to the youth report at about an hour and 15 minutes into the meeting. Our youth went where? Can somebody talk to me about that? Right? Mission report, SPRC, the trustees, I think there's a problem with the, yeah, with the um, stuff in the bathroom, right? We don't have any hand towels. Got to talk about that. Might be a leak in the bathroom as well. Who's going to unlock the church this coming month? Do we have a roster for that? And is there somebody that's put their name down? So we have to get through all of that just to get to old business two hours into this painful process. Finally, we can get to new business such as there's an offering at annual conference we have to talk about. And then someone finally says, is there other, any other new business? And in 
your head, right? You are screaming silently to yourself, no, 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 please, no. Nothing else, right? Nothing else. So then we kind of fade away into the next meeting date, and by that point, probably everybody there is saying, I don't care. Just put it on an evening that I'm out of town, right? That is the perfect next meeting date. So, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I imagine all of us have been in a meeting, maybe two, maybe more, that looked somewhat like that. So why do our meetings take so long? Because the council is not doing their job. You know what the punchline is, right? Oh no, they're not doing their job, they're doing everyone else's job. So what is the council or the board's job? Oh, it's not doing my slide builds. It's governance. <laughs> it's supposed to be on the previous slide. It's governance. So instead of managing, the council's role is governance. It comes from the Latin gubernare and the Greek kuberneo. I don't know where Andy is. He could probably make sure I'm pronouncing those right. But both mean to steer from a position of authority. Governance, not management. There are lots of decisions that happen. There are lots of decisions that the church council should not make because it's not their task to make all of those decisions. Now, and Eric, excuse me, put in a sports analogy, and I will, I will admit up front, I am not a baseball person. So we're going to walk through this, and please be kind to me if I if I'm a little bit off in what everybody does. So, all of the people involved. You have players, right? You have managers, you have coaches, you have assistant managers and coaches, you have cheerleaders, you have fans, you have umpires, you have league commissioners, and of course you have an owner or two. Imagine that as the church. Okay, so let's think about the roles of each of these positions. What do they do? The players play the game, right? Fairly simple, straightforward. The assistant managers and coaches, they manage the players. The head manager leads the team. The fans, well, they sometimes cheer and they sometimes boo. And the commissioners, write the rules, make decisions on the schedule, set the boundaries, for example, how to score, how many outs, how many points. Eric gave an example and said, wouldn't it be kind of fun if the commissioners tried to make the game a little bit more exciting? So you got one point if you got to first base, two points if you got to second base, three points if you made it to third base, and four points to get home. And everybody laughed, but his point was that, was, that would be a decision that would change the game. So that's a decision that the commissioners would make. They change the rules in which turn that can change the game. So what about in the church? In the church, the players or the congregation. The assistant managers and the assistant coaches are our team leaders, our committee leaders, our chair people. The head coach is the pastor. The fans and the non-fans are the world around us. And the league commissioners are the church council. And we all know who the owner is, right? Okay? So, we come back to what is the job of the council and the board? It is governance, not managing. When a, man, a council operates in a governance position, excuse me, when they operate in a management position instead of a government, governance position, it takes lots of time, it strips authority away from the committees, and ultimately, it's disheartening to your committee members, right? If you're on the worship committee and you've decided that you're going to hand out carnations, and then the board says, what color, how many, can you, where did the money come from, should it be spent there, Likewise, if you're, you know, if you're dealing with the music program and the board says, you're going to do what with that money? It can be very disheartening. 
And I think we probably all see evidence of that in committees, where people feel as if they're not empowered and they don't have the ability to make those decisions. If you give your committees the responsibility, then you have to give them the authority to be responsible. So, let's look at functions of governance. There are really four things that, um, that a church council does in terms of governance. And the first is to set the boundaries. Next after that is to write the rules. Somebody has to write the rules. Determine what a win looks like for your church. And then look at the big picture and focus on that. So let's look at each of these just briefly. So first of all, setting the boundaries. The purpose of boundaries is really to kind of keep your church between the ditches, right? So that you don't go totally off the rails. So an example of a boundary is a budget. You have a budget and it serves as a financial boundary. So if you have those boundaries and you have given those boundaries to your teams, then they get to operate within those boundaries, right? If you've set the boundary and then given a pool of dollars to the worship team or to the youth ministry team or to whatever team within your church, then if, for instance, the worship team wants to spend $120 on music and then they change their mind and want to spend $140 on choir robes, as long as that's within their budget, that's their decision. And they don't have to ask for permission. Now sometimes there are cash flow issues. I don't want to make light of that. There are cash flow issues and there are questions that have to be asked. But the budget is a boundary, all right? Not something to be micromanaged at each committee level. When the council does a really good job of setting the boundaries, their work is almost done, right? They have to tweak that every so often, but with regard to boundaries, their work is almost done because it then becomes something that the committees and the teams pick up. Next, write the rules. The church council writes policy. <laughs> Yay, the fun stuff, right? Things such as a discipline, safe sanctuary, building use, weddings, building, excuse me, sanctuary use, investments, personnel, all of these things, they write the policies. When a board does a really good job of establishing boundaries and then rules so that their committees, so the committees know what those boundaries are and what the rules are, the council's workload drops dramatically because you're not micromanaging everything. The right folks are doing the right jobs. And then that gives them time to look for the wins and to help the church figure out what does a win look like? Is it a win if you pay your apportionments? Is it a win if you have 50 more members in church? Is it a win if you have five kids in vacation Bible school, if you have 10 kids in vacation Bible school? 20, average worship attendance, what are the wins that your church is looking for? And some that take some thoughtful, I think some thoughtful consideration from the church council are things such as how many new disciples have begun their faith journey because of what you do within your church? What evidence have we seen that because of what we're doing, People are growing in their relationship with Christ. How are we reaching people through worship, education, small groups, so that the church is becoming part of everyday life? How are members, our members, giving their lives in service to others through mission? But this is a process that is unique to each church. What is important to your church family? And that is something that the church council wrangles with. And that brings me kind of to the final point of those four of governance, which is looking at the big picture and looking at strategic planning. 
And a lot of times what's used in strategic planning is uh, called a SWOT analysis. And it's looking at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats that exist. And I do this in my work life, and it is something that I think is very valuable for churches as well. Because it lets you take a look at that big picture. It lets you take a look at the strengths of your church. What is it that you do well? What is it that you do that is critical to your community? You know, we talk about, in our church, we've talked about the things that the community would miss if our church was no longer open. What are those critical things, those strengths that you bring to the community that you serve? What are our weaknesses? Where are we lacking? Where are we not paying attention to something that we should be paying attention to? Where are the opportunities around us that we could be helping with? Then maybe we're not. Maybe we're not plugged in in the right places in our community. What are those things that can strengthen our community and ourselves, our church as well? So what are those opportunities? And then finally, what are the threats? What are the things that put our church at risk? Is it money? Is it the number of people in the pews? Is it something happening outside of our church and our community? Maybe some business is going away. Maybe some transition is happening in the community that is a threat. So these are all things to consider within a SWOT analysis. And what a SWOT can do is ultimately it helps the church focus because it kind of clears away some of that stuff on the edges, right? And helps you focus. And it also helps the church ask the right questions. What are we doing? What do we need to get bad, better at in order to reach the goals that we've talked about? What are we doing better than others? What are others doing better than us that we need to learn from and that we need to strengthen? And what are the things that people are doing better than us that we don't need to own? That it's okay that there's somewhere else in the community or somewhere else that provides that service or that growth opportunity. So the goal really is that when the council focuses on governance rather than managing, all of those micro decisions are cleared out of the way and they can look at longer range vision and the committees can function more efficiently because they don't have council members kind of in amongst some of the workings of the committee. And your committee members are more engaged and more vitalized. So, how do we keep this from happening? Eric has a great um, layout that they use at Palmyra. He calls it the 90 minute meeting. He says it's worked very well for them. Basically they have 30 minutes that is, um, that is for opening and equipping their council members. And then they spend 30 minutes talking about the main thing that evening. And then they spend 30 minutes on maintenance issues. And I don't mean physical maintenance, but just things that the council may have to look at periodically to keep the church going. One of the key things with this approach is that you have to be prepared, right? So everybody gets the meeting materials before the meeting. So they get the meeting agenda, they get the minutes, and the reports all prior to the meeting, Eric said their packet is usually about 45 to 50 pages. But everybody gets that at the end of the week before the council meeting. And they're expected to look at it, to read it, spend a little bit of time with it, and make sure that everything makes sense. And if there are any questions, um, that they have got those. Because in this model, you do a, cons a consent agenda, so you're not gonna go through each of those reports. Everybody's gotten them ahead of time. It's their responsibility to review them ahead of time. So when you get to the meeting, guess what? That hour and a half or hour and 15 minutes that was spent going through all of the reports, yeah, that goes away. That goes away, all right? Because there's one vote to say, do we approve on a consent agenda? And if there are things that need to be pulled out because they're in there either, you know, have been overlooked and put in there um, by mistake or if there's something that really is an issue that the council needs to deal with, then it can be pulled out at that point in time. 
So the meeting opens with prayer. The consent agenda, as we talked about, has the minutes, the financial report, committee reports, old business that does not need any actions, required decisions that will need to be approved. And then the question is asked, is there anything that needs to come off of this, off of the consent agenda, to be put on the regular council agenda for discussion at a later time? Not necessarily hashed, rehashed, and re-re-rehashed that evening, but something that needs to be looked at. Then there's a learning time, and I love this idea. Um, Eric said that right now they are looking at um, they're looking at the five fruits, I believe, the five fruitful practices of a congregation. But they have a time together as a council, either with a speaker, a book study, a video study, something that helps them learn and grow spiritually together and have some conversation about where each of them is in their spiritual development and how all of that works together and what it looks like. And as you go through that sort of a process, of course, you have a more cohesive board because you know where other folks are coming from and you know that you're all moving down the same path and can work better together. And then you spend 30 minutes working on the main thing. That can be something that is related to policy, something related to a goal with the church. Maybe you're looking at the mission of the church or your vision or something along those lines that really needs to have that in-depth thought and consideration. Can be looking at a problem that may, you know, we talked earlier about what are the threats. If there's something going on in the community that the council feels called to talk about, this is the time to do that. Okay, this is when you do the heavy lifting. But this is outlined on the agenda, so this isn't something that you can just throw a whole bunch of stuff, right? This is the main thing, the one thing that needs consideration. And then maintenance issues, such as, do we need to adjust the budget? Has something happened that we need to adjust the budget? Do we need to look at a policy? Maybe something happened within the church life that there's a policy that you realize is no longer working for your church, and you need to look at that. If there are other issues, again, and then setting the, new, the next meeting date, and I would imagine that when you set this next meeting date, there are not a whole bunch of folks sitting in the meeting going, just make it for a day, I'm not here, right? Because you've taken away all of that minutia, and you've taken away all of the rehashing of all of the committee reports and all of the actions that have already been decided and things such as that. And all of this is written down in advance so people know it before they get there so that you can have action. And Eric included an example of what this looks like at Palmyra UMC. So at 6.30 is what he calls part one, which is gathering and learning. The opening prayer, call to order, the consent agenda, that's over and done with in the first five minutes. And then the group has 25 minutes to spend together in learning time. Then they move into the main thing, which on this agenda was the building use policy. They needed to do some adjustment to that for the church to, family to feel comfortable with how the building was being used. Definitely that's something that the council has to look at, right? Because that's policy. And then comes management issues. They needed new signatures for the CDs. And they had some suggestions from the building committee. And then they set the next meeting, and they're done. Looks pretty like a beautiful agenda to me. I don't know about you guys, but. So, council meetings can be uplifting and effective, but in order for this to happen, it is very important that the council be proactive, first and foremost, that they need to think through the church's goals and the role that the council should play in that. And that doesn't happen overnight. That may be the main thing for several meetings. Planning is important. 
So making sure that you're providing the materials ahead of time, making sure that someone is thinking through issues that might be voiced or issues that might come up so that, again, that can be addressed as part of the planning process so that the time that you're together in that meeting is spent as efficiently as possible. And then finally, time in prayer. So it's important for the church council, both as a body together and individually, to spend time in prayer, discerning how the council can best meet the opportunities that the church faces. Ultimately, you want one of these kind of things happening at the end of your church council meeting, where everybody throws their hands in the air and says, hallelujah, what a good meeting this was. Right? And it's possible. That's it. Any questions? I'm sorry? Why did 